let's get give a big round of applause to Kenny Gorman. He's the head of streaming products. Woo, 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 woo. And he's going to be talking us through how to build event-driven applications. Here we go, Kenny. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? All right. So, uh, yeah, my name is Kenny Gorman. I'm the head of streaming products here at MongoDB. Uh, we're going to spend about 45 minutes talking together about stream processing. I'm going to kind of walk you through it. Let me just give you a real quick bio on myself. Uh, I've been working with databases for many, many years, almost 30 years now. Uh, I've been working with Mongo since the very beginning. Uh, happy to be doing that as both a customer and now as an employee. Uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from. I've been a customer and I understand uh, sometimes your pain and I also understand why you love MongoDB. Um, and most recently, we've been working on Atlas Stream Processing and I'm gonna walk you through how that kind of works. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about future stuff, so there's some safe harbor in here. Read it real quick. There you go, that's enough. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about why, why did we do this? Why did we build stream processing? What does it do for you? What was our motivation and thinking behind it? Then I'm gonna intro you to the product, what it does, the components, how it works. I will talk about the stream processing instance itself and what that is and how that plays a role in stream processing. I'll walk you through a live demo, God's willing, uh, of creating a stream processor. We'll talk a little bit about that. We're gonna be using the Xcode, um, or the VS Code, excuse me, the VS Code plugin for that, so that'll be cool. And then we're gonna talk about some advanced capabilities. So some things that are different with stream processing than just normal database operations and why they're in there and what they do. All right, so let's, let's talk about why we did this. So, MongoDB has had the Kafka connector for many years, uh, more than five at least, and it's very popular. Customers have wanted to connect Kafka topics to Mongo collections, essentially. And we have thousands of customers using this. But they wanted more functionality. Over time, we wanted more control. We wanted the ability to do mutations and change that data. And frankly, we wanted an easier developer paradigm. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. Um, and these use cases span all sorts of verticals, from IoT and manufacturing and aerospace to th customer 360 and things like this. So every vertical has streaming data. Kafka is a prevalent term. You know, streaming data is something we talk about all the time now. So it's really about building more compelling applications for your customers. And you should be thinking about streaming applications when you're thinking about the latency of that data. When do I need it to deliver it to my customer? How sensitive are they to old or stale data? And how can I integrate and build compelling systems using just-in-time or real-time real data? So our thesis here is that stream processing itself, so this isn't a streaming system, we're not replacing Kafka, we're working with it, hand-in-hand, hand, or chain streams, by the way. Uh, it's a fundamental building block for modern applications. So stream processing is a component that's very important in building stacks, building applications, and delivering value to the customers based on data. I think you saw it in Sahir's slide. It's one of those core building blocks you see in that diagram. I didn't draw it here, but th that's your mental model. Now, you might say, like, how different is this? How, like, it's a new thing to learn? Am I going to struggle? Like, uh, there's enough, right? Like, there's enough complication out there. Well, look, so MongoDB cares a lot about developers. I think that's obvious. We've talked about that ad nauseum. But what we wanted to do with stream processing is ensure that the developer paradigm was very clear and clean. And we wanted to leverage the things that Mongo has done for many years. Uh, it's like the document model, the ease of development, things like this. And so in your heads, just kind of think of it like this. It's pretty simple. A document in the database, you've worked with this for a long time. It's got a primary key, maybe some indexes, it lives in a collection. Uh, it's mutable. You can change it. You can update one or update on it, right? Update many. An event is very, very similar, except it has a timestamp, OK? Instead of a primary key, it's, that's its primary key, if you will, that timestamp, that time that event happened. And it's immutable. So if you want to change the thing that happened, you have to issue a new event. You have to say, like, correction, there's a new thing. But that's kind of it. They look a lot 
similar. They kind of look, they have the same JSONic looking document structure like we've seen before, and they can be complex. And so that leads me to the next thing that's kind of complicated with stream processing. So think of it this way. If the document model mattered a lot to the database, it really matters for streaming. And here's what I mean. Imagine we have a set of streaming events. And imagine they're coming in, I don't know, let's take an IoT sensor, okay? And it lives in the field, and maybe there's thousands of them. And maybe they're reporting once a second, okay? One hertz, or maybe a thousand hertz, right? This is common. And let's say some of those get deployed with a new firmware that now is emitting an embedded document that's an array. What would happen normally in the world? Everything downstream would crash, right? Everything would not know that schema. Everything would break. So the velocity actually makes the document model matter more than maybe it did before, if that makes sense. So take a look here, right? We have a number of measurements in this example. The top one has uh, a measurements array with temperature. The next one has a measurements where it's spelled out differently. The next one below that has a, you know, it's all in one line or it's missing data. It doesn't have the com complete payload. This is normal streaming data. I think a lot of us think that streaming data is like this nice, pure, perfect piece of data that's always coming in on a time, perfectly timed schedule. It's never late. It's never, it's always got a perfect schema. In reality, it's not. And so the thing I want you to take away here and think about is that the document model, document model works great for streaming, maybe even more importantly than it ever did in the database. So. Those are kind of the, the justifications and the reasoning why we were thinking about stream processing in the first place. Obviously, it's built around the document model. I just talked about why flexible schemas matter, how that can happen in production or in, in, in big systems, and, and what a pain it is. It handles continuous processing. So this is a little bit different. So think of it uh, in the database. You're going to run a query. Okay, So you just run a find or something. And what does it do? Right, It goes out. It reads. Uh, maybe it's using an index plan, hopefully. It's reading that index, it's going and fetching the blocks, it's building a cursor, it's returning and exhausting that cursor and giving you your data back, but then it exits. It's done. That's not how it works in streaming. Streaming is continuously processing data. So part of building Atlas Stream Processing was changing the underlying code to continuously run aggregations, and I'm going to show you that. A um, couple things that we did do, a couple new things, I'm going to talk about this in advanced features is we added data validation. So if you're familiar with dollar validate in MongoDB, we've got that in streaming. And we've added some new primitives, like stateful window handling. So checkpointing, keeping state, and then doing aggregations over windows. That's a core primitive that lots of people do in streaming. We've added that as well. OK, so I just talked about continuous processing. These are sort of like super important tenets of stream processing. The data is being handled continuously. It's reading from some source, something's being processed, and it's writing to a sync. That's essentially stream processing. So we've added continuous processing. We've added this continuous validation. So in that example I showed before, if you got something that you didn't want to ever be in MongoDB, maybe it's a, an array, a nested array, that's, maybe it's not important, or maybe the old firmware is not something you want to read in my example, you could add a validate rule. And that validate rule would put the data in a dead letter queue. And I'll talk about how that plays into this. And lastly, continuous merge. So let's say I have this example, this IoT example I was talking about. And let's say the data is going to end up in MongoDB in a collection. Continuous merge continuously reads off the end of this aggregation, the stream processor, and it continuously updates the materialized view in MongoDB. So you have a collection that's continuously updated. That data is always going to be fresh. And this is how you use it in those use cases I just talked about. So those are the key things. Think continuous. It's always running in the background. Uh, and I'm going to show you some tricks about how to see that data. <clears throat> OK. Let's talk a little bit about how it works. Like, how is it architected? How, do things, how, do things, how are things arranged here? So on the left hand, on your left-hand side here, uh, we're going to have the input, the source, which is the streaming system. Anything Kafka Wire Protocol, that means Confluent, Red Panda, uh, anything that's got the Kafka Wire Protocol, 
you give it a connect string, it's gonna use, if you're familiar, librd Kafka, connect to that with the native driver, and pull that data into Atlas Stream Processing. Uh, you can also, by the way, uh, use chain streams. Uh, so we, we find that customers are about 50-50 right now, chain streams versus Kafka. Then you, in the stream processor, you can aggregate, filter, you can do anything that exists, almost everything, that exists in the aggregation framework language. And I'll show some examples of that. So what you're really doing is building a processor in the aggregation framework. It's continuously running, pulling data from some source, and then pushing it to some sync. In this case, you can push to an Atlas collection via merge, or you can dollar emit out to Kafka. So it can do Kafka to Kafka. It never even put the data in the database. It can read from a chain stream and put it to Kafka. You can read from Kafka and put it into the database. You've got all sorts of options. And we're adding more and more connectors as we go. So Kinesis is coming very soon, and we'll continue to add more and more over time. OK, so I was here a year ago, and we announced the uh, preview of, of Atlas Stream Processing. And you might ask, OK, that was cool. I was, there, I was here then. What's new? So a couple of things that we've been doing. The preview period was amazing. There's over 1,600 of you that came in and used the product. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the feedback. We listened. So we've added a ton of stuff for the dev experience. Um, we've, um, we've added new tiers, pricing tiers, so a smaller dev instance so you can get started and then grow, as Sahir mentioned earlier today. We've added native integration for time series, so you can emit. I was just talking about how do you emit to Mongo. You can emit to time series collections. Uh, we've really dialed in the Kafka support. So things like um, consumer groups and headers, those things are all coming and important. Uh, we've added security improvements and uh, alerting, uh, some observability improvements. So a lot of stuff came out of that preview. Thank you very much for those of you who participated. We're excited now that we're GA to continue to build. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about the stream processing instance itself. Hopefully this will clear things up for you if you're confused. So we have a stream processing instance. It's sort of like a database instance uh, or a database cluster, if you will, on MongoDB Atlas that you're probably familiar with, except it's just metadata. It's just a container that you're going to run these stream processors or these stream processing jobs in. So when you create it, you just name it. It's just a space in which you're going to run it. It lives on a provider in a region, so a cloud provider, AWS, USE, something like this. And that's where these processors will start and run, OK? So you think of it as a container that your processors are going to run inside. And of course, it's on Atlas, so it's close to the Atlas clusters. It can interoperate, interoperate with those clusters easily. Then there's the connection registry. So here's how that works. The connection registry is essentially a list or a roster of all the connections I'm using. So imagine that Kafka example. How would I you know, input the creds? And how would I give it the connect string, the broker string? Well. That's what the connection registry is. So you give it a logical name, like Kenny's IoT Kafka topic. You give it the credentials, so like SAS or plane. You connect to maybe Confluent Cloud, or Red Panda Cloud, or Amazon Azure, whatever. Doesn't matter. Wire protocol compatible. You give that logical name, and then you can use it in your pipelines. Really, really simple. In the shell, I'll show this. You can list those connections and start using them. All right. So. Let's get into the anatomy of a stream processor. So again, our thinking here was to keep this simple. You all have enough stuff going on in your lives. If I want to introduce something called a stream processor to MongoDB Atlas, you want it to be simple. You want to just kind of know how to do it day one. So we leveraged the document model. I talked about that, but also the aggregation language. So let's kind of walk through this. You'll see that we defined a variable called source, okay, and that's going to be a named source out of that connection registry. Then we've got, say, a match. Like, we're just going to use a match stage. Then we're going to create a sync. That's where it's going to land. The data is going to land. And then we're going to call sp.process and run it. But that's kind of it. It's just an aggregation statement. It's an array of stages defined just like a normal db.aggregate. And this, this is the basic anatomy. Now, one thing I want to show you, I'm going to show you this live. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but sp.process. Let's talk about this real quick. So one of the things, talking about developer experience, one of the things we had a problem with early on, and I think the industry kind of has a problem with, is that data and topics is opaque. It's hard to see. 
you need a, like a collection of command line tools and like KCAD and pipe and awk. And it's, it's frustrating. It's just not a first class experience. So sp.process allows you to just look at the topic and try these stream processors. You can just run them, try them, take stages out, iterate on it, and the results are spooled to the screen, and continuously spooled to the screen, so that you can continue to develop on them. So it's really handy, I'll show it. And if you just want to peek at a topic, I'll show you this trick. You just put the, you just put the uh, connection registry string in there, and just one stage to this processor, just look at the topic, and it'll spool the whole thing out. Super cool. OK, so this is kind of what I was just talking about, just showing a little bit more detail here. The thing I want to point out at the end here is we're going to create that pipeline, right? So it's just, it's just an array of stages. Um, we're going to add, you'll see the document there with timestamp like we talked about before, the difference between document and a event. You'll see I kind of control C it there, that little green control C, might be hard to see. Um, and then um, sp.process again. So you can kind of iterate on this, use it in real time, build more complex uh, pipelines as you go. But that's not the only way to run it. You can do start, and it'll go into the background. You can obviously do stop. It's got stats. I'm going to show that super cool. You can drop them. You can list them. And you can list all the connections. So, and there's more commands, too. These are some of just the primitives, primitive commands that you would use in a typical dev session. OK, let's jump into a demo, see how this works. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, thumbs up? OK. I can zoom in more if you need to, so. All right, I'm getting some thumbs up. All right, let's take it from the top. So what are you looking at? So this is VS Code. Some of you, most of you are familiar with this. Raise your, I can see you, so raise your hand if you're using VS Code developing today. Come on, don't be shy. OK, that's a, wow. OK, that's most of, that might be most of you. So very popular development paradigm, right? Development software for, for working with, with data and software. Uh, and we've had, the, we've had VS Code plug in for MongoDB for some time. Um, we've added it for Atlas Stream Processing. That's relatively new. Let's kind of walk you through it. Now, first thing I want to point out, this isn't a shell session. This is a file. And I know that might seem trivial, but checking in your files and checking in your stream processors into Git is important. And being able to pull them from Git, work on them, do PRs, work with the team, and collaborate. That's an important piece of this. So Xcode, or uh, VS Code, I've said that twice now. VS Code uh, is great for that, and the plugin works perfect for that. Um, so let's, let's just take a look. Let's run some stuff. So the way this works, this plugin works, if you haven't seen it, is you highlight what you want to run, and then you hit, you hit play. So that's me listing connections. So that goes to that connection registry that I talked about. It's going to pull back all the connections that I have listed. So you'll see I have a dev Coptic cluster. I've got a sharded Atlas uh, uh, cluster. I've got another cluster for, uh, for MongoDB. And then I've got this sample seam stream solar. So the last one is included. It's just an in-memory generator of some IoT data. So we're going to use that here just because we want to have all sorts of connections. So let's walk you through it. So I'll get rid of that. So here's my first stage. I'm going to go ahead and pull from that sample stream solar. OK, the first stage is the source, always has to be that. Then I'm going to unwind one of the arrays in that data so I can look at the, look at the, the, the value on its own. Then I'm going to create a group by one of those embedded values and the maximum. So we're going to do some math here a little bit later in the stage. We're going to create a tumbling window. This is one of those new primitives I talked about. And this window is going to tum tumble every 10 seconds. So that means we're going we're to aggregate data for 10 seconds. We'll tumble and output it. So the stream is going to be emitting every 10 seconds. Okay. So if this was emitting and merging to Kafka, you'd see a message every 10 seconds. If it was into Atlas, you'd see something being put into your collection every 10 seconds. And you can set this to whatever you want, minutes, hours, whatever it might be, to make, to make sense for your use case. Um, then we're going to specify the pipeline for that window, which is that unwind and that group that I showed above. Then we're going to add some fields to it, kind of clean this up a little bit. So we're going to say, oh, OK, I want this field called production that is rounding, dividing average watts by max watts. 
and then I'm gonna merge that, merge that into a collection. So what we're basically doing is calculating how efficient these pretend solar panels are. But let's look at this last stage. This is a little bit more advanced functionality. I put this in there because I think it's really cool and fun. Thank you, Joe, who worked on this. Uh, this is basically a conditional operator. So what we're saying here is, hey, if the solar panels are less than 50% producing, I want them to go in an error state. If they're above that, they're fine, they're working fine, but I want the maintenance tech to go and look and say maybe they're shaded or maybe the cables are messed up or something or whatever, whatever happens to solar panels when they go bad. Uh, and so this gives you a tally of good and bad. And maybe this is an application that someone in the field is looking at on their tablet and saying, ah, I've got these, these particular solar panels to go check, they're not producing. Okay, so let's run it. Oh, and one more thing here I just wanna show you. I'm creating the stream processor here, I'm naming it Watts Checker, and I'm giving it the stages, okay? So source um, T was tumbling window, A is add fields, and M is merge. So that's what that pipeline does, it's pretty simple. So let me go back and highlight this. Just so you see what we're doing. I'm gonna scroll down and run it. Takes a second to step uh, to start up. It's going to that instance, uh, that, that stream processing instance. It's finding in Kubernetes something to be deployed on, deploying that and starting up and running. And you see the typical OK1 there on the playground. So that's running. Cool, it actually worked. Live demos. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's look at it though. That's not OK. One's not super exciting. Let's let's kind of look at this. So just like everything else in MongoDB, we tried to follow the same syntax, right? So dot stats would be something that would be obvious. You you're probably used to saying collection dot stats. Well, in this case, you'll say stream processor dot stats. And in this case, it's verbose equal true, which gives you a ton of information. So this is like a little mini profiler. It gives you the timings, the document counts. Um, and tons of information at each stage. So you can look through your stage, you could say, oh, the latency is all coming from this match that I'm running. Or you can say, I didn't realize there's a million messages a second coming in on this stage. I'm matching 10% of them, and only 10% are going out the other side. So it really gives you good insight, a good observability hack uh, for, looking at, for looking at your streams. This is something that's really hard to do with other systems. Like you have to write a Flink program to do this in Java. Like it's just really hard to do in other systems. So here you can see me, you can see my state size. So that window that you saw is actually state saved on disk durably. There's actually a checkpoint for that as well. So if we fail and we recover, we don't have to go replay that 10 second window. We actually can pick up right where it failed because we keep that state in memory, including the arithmetic. It gives you some timings, it gives you some bytes. Um, down here, you'll notice on the group, you'll see that state, I just mentioned that, I guess. And then you'll see the merge at the bottom. And you can see the sizing and number of messages. And lastly, that watermark, okay? So there you have it. That's a stream processor running. Let's go over to the shell here, make that bigger, and show collections. Boy, I'm glad those showed up. And let's just do, Let's just look at that. So all those values should be above 50%, dot five zero, right? Let's see if it worked. Yep, five, four, eight, three, seven, nine. I'm pressing my luck here, aren't I? Yeah, so it looks like all these are above value. These are all the good solar panels. Let's try and find those bad ones. Let's just do a find. All right, so here we've got 0 0.46, 0 0.23, 0 0.48. You get the idea. So this would drive that application that that tech would use in the field uh, to view what, what panels are down or bad and uh, then go address them. All right, that's a live demo. All right, you can switch back to the slides now. Thank you. All right. Man, am I happy about that, I'll tell you. Okay. So... 
talk a little bit more about a couple advanced commands. I'll lead you through kind of the breadth and depth of a few more commands, and then we'll take some questions. So I've got about, uh, I'm gonna do about 10 minutes of questions, and I've got 10 more minutes of this content. So just to kind of give you a feeling. Okay, so with the stream processor, we introduced something called sample. And I talked a little bit about it, like with dot process, it's, it's something that's interactive. Uh, you wanna be able to see what's happening in your stream processor. You just kinda don't know. You can't reason about the data. You can't see the data structures, it's opaque. Dot process really fixes that for you. Dot sample goes even further. So dot sample, let's say I have a stream processor that's running in that background. It's running, it's been running for a week, and you're like, it doesn't seem like it's working anymore. I wanna go check on this thing. How do you inspect it? How do you look at it? Well, you can call dot stats on it, or you can call dot sample. Essentially, what sample does is pulls it into the foreground and starts spooling those documents to the, to the screen, um, just like process would. So very handy. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Kafka integration, okay? So in our source, mine was very simple, but we allow for a lot more, a lot more advanced processing here. So you can obviously give it a topic. It wouldn't be any good if you couldn't do that. You can give it config information like the group ID that you're using. You can specify the time field in the data. So in streaming systems, you can say, well, I want the, the, the canonical timestamp to be when it was put into Kafka. Or you can say, no, no, no. The data itself knows its timestamp, like maybe a sensor would do this. Go ahead and tell me what field is the timestamp, and I'll use that. So when you say time field, you can actually put a expression on it. So to date, sensor time, would then convert it into a timestamp, a BSON timestamp, and that would be the underscore TS I talked about before. Very powerful paradigm there. And then allowed lateness. So earlier I talked about, like, data can be late. It's never perfect in streaming systems. What if I did that window every 10 seconds, and what if data came in with that right timestamp, but it was 11 seconds or 12 seconds? past. Well, that data would be late, and my calculation would not include it. What do I do? How does it work? So allowed lateness allows you to specify how long to wait to close that window. So maybe I said two seconds. I could have waited 12 seconds then. So it's a buffer. Beyond that, the data gets put to the dead letter queue. I'm going to show dead letter queue in a minute. Data will never be put on the thrown on the floor. So one of the design tenets is data doesn't go on the floor. We don't miss or skip events. If it's not being computed, then there's a rule set for how to handle it. Most of the time, that's gonna be the dead letter queue. All right. And then this gets to the rich operator, and it's, it's really an ecosystem at this point. If you Google for you know, MongoDB Ag frame, Framework Merge, you immediately get an example. In fact, you can even run it in ChatGPT. So this rich ecosystem of, of aggregation statements, operators, works in stream processing as well. There's a few caveats, but for the most part, everything you're gonna to wanna to do, mathematical operations, uh, date time manipulation, uh, equality, all the stuff, that's gonna work in stream processing too. So if you're used to using ag, today, tomorrow, you can make a stream processor without too much hassle. Uh, I showed you a tumble window, but that's not the only kind. There's a hopping and tumbling, and we're gonna be adding more over time. Um, and that has an implicit projection, and I didn't really show that to you. But that projection keeps the timestamp of the start and end in the document. So you'll see stream, this thing underscore stream meta that you can see there at the bottom. That key will hold, the document uh, for that key will hold the information about that stream. So it's whether it came from Kafka, whether you've been operating it on a window. So we're enriching this event with things that happen during its life cycle. And that just gives you yet more observability and telemetry to work with with your streams. I talked about this a little bit, continuous merge collections, continuously merge in the background. I think the thing I want to point out here is that you can do it in an insert or upsert manner. Okay, so it's not an insert only paradigm, it can be an upsert as well. You saw me in the demo do a more comp even a more complicated example. But this is super handy. This is how you're gonna write data basically to MongoDB. The collection downstream can be time series, the collection downstream can be indexed the way you want. It can be a cap collection. It can be, it's just a regular Mongo collection. So you can use it however you want to use it. Very flexible. Okay, validate. This one's super important. So in the world of streaming, if you're familiar, there's sort of this idea of schemas. And sometimes you can serialize data like in something like Avro, 
Sometimes you might use a schema registry. There's lots of different takes on how to, how to handle schema in stream processing. And because we're a document model and we're a flexible schema, we want to have additional capabilities in this regard. And the way we handle it in the database is validate, right? We've all probably done a validate rule. So we brought that over to streaming. And it's very powerful in the streaming paradigm. So just to kind of point out a couple of interesting things here, you can say, um, in this case, you can say um, these particular keys are required or not. Otherwise, it goes to the dead letter queue. You can actually, in this, in this case, this example, it's actually giving um, a regex on the date. So if dates are coming in, you know, dates and times are a pain. <laughs> They've always been a pain. They continue to be a pain. But we're giving you tools to work with them. So in this case, if the date timestamp doesn't come in a particular pattern, you can put that in the dead letter queue. Again, nothing's going on the floor. We're keeping track of things that are coming through the pipeline, give you options to work with it. So this is that dead letter queue I've been talking about. I've talked about it about four or five times now. All it really is is a collection. Okay, it's a collection where we're going to put data that you've specified shouldn't go through the stream processor for some reason or another. If it's late, if it doesn't match validate, if we can't deserialize it, I don't know, if it's a JPEG that comes through in your document, not JSON, it's going to go in the dead letter queue. Okay? So that's how that works. Um, it's relatively easy to configure. You just basically give it an atlas location, and that's where the data is going to go. Okay, so those, so those are some advanced things to think about and using your use cases. So what is ahead for stream processing? Like, we just got started. We've been working on this for two years. We've been in preview for like half a year, three quarters of a year. Now today we're at GA. What's coming in the future? So number one, more cloud providers and regions. Today we're in AWS, but Azure and GCP are coming very soon. We're going to be adding more and more advanced networking capabilities. So things like VPC peering, things like um, private link and more. We're going to be adding those over time. I already talked about we're adding more sources and sinks. So Kinesis is coming. We're going to be adding more, more and more of those over time. So it's more and more interoperability with these, with these external systems. And then kind of everybody's favorite is metrics and observability. So I showed you, I, I think I sh hopefully showed you a bunch of ways where we have excellent observability and metrics. But we're going even further. There'll be more, more things coming out. Atlas integration, graphs and charts, things like this. So today I showed you more of a command line thing, but uh, deeper and richer metrics with, with Atlas is coming. OK, so what to take away here? So we've added native stream processing to Atlas. Like that's, that's, that's the core thing that we've done here. Um, and it's the main keyword there is continuous. The way it works is we continuously run these queries processing data from source to sync. The source can be chain streaming or Kafka. Kinesis is coming. The sync could be Kinesis, Kafka, or MongoDB. Okay. Um, it leverages and extends the aggregation framework. If you're developing MongoDB and you're writing aggregation statements today, you're already a stream processor developer. You are right now. You can just go try it tonight. You're already good enough to go. Go give it a shot. You'll be surprised. It's pretty fun. So log in, get started provision an instance, uh, and give us some feedback. The community forums on MongoDB, uh, community.mongodb.com community slash forums. Hit us up. Let us know how you like it. Let us know what you want, and we'll add you to the, next, uh, to the stuff that's coming next. OK, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do some questions. I've got about 10 minutes, so we, we can take some questions. Yeah. The headset, and I'm going to go run around. Okay. All right, friends. Who has a question for Kenny? I know you probably have something on your mind. Raise them up high so I can see you. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful session. Uh, one quick question I had was, do we have plans, does MongoDB have plans to support file reading or SQL streaming or MQ or any other tools other than Kafka. Uh, for example, I can read data from file directly and insert into MongoDB as a stream uh, of data, or let's say if I have MQ connection or something like that. Yeah, this is a great question. I'm assuming everybody can hear the question on the headphones. Uh, if not, just wave at me. Like, I'm not sure exactly how this works. But um, so, yes. So, 
over time, we're gonna be adding more sources and sinks, and so that's kind of what that means. And I think there's kind of two options for you right now. Um, if you wanna read files, you can read them using Kafka tooling and read those files into Kafka, and then we can read them. We can do that today. Um, but in the future, we're gonna do things like, you probably, one requested feature that's come out has been um, S3 sync, like that's an obvious one, right? To continuously write to S3. So over time, we're gonna be adding those. We're adding Kinesis. Part of being a good partner is we wanna use all of their tooling in nice ways. Obviously, file, like using something like S3 is a, is, would be a great option there. All those, they're all prioritized. We've got a long list of those things over the next year or so, um, but essentially, yes. Uh, that's how we're gonna do it for files. And then for other queuing systems, it's just a priority for us, quite frankly. Uh, you know, like, like I said, Kinesis is coming. Um, anything Kafka Wire Protocol today works. Anything Mongo, uh, you know, uh, Chain Stream works today. Um, but over time, yes, we want to add. I mentioned Solus. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Solus. It's used kind of in enterprise settings. Maybe some of your users. That's coming too. It's been highly requested, um, and we'll continue to add those over time. Yeah. Good question. All right, folks, I know you have questions. The neurons firing. Kenny did a great job, but he can answer every question, right? I can answer any question. Try and stop me. See what you got. Let's do this. Ooh, challenge. <laughs> All right, Kenny, I have a question. What are some blind spots, if any, for people who are trying to, uh, you know, create app, uh, event-driven apps and can really use stream processing? What are some blind spots and some lessons learned that can really help them get up moving? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing to think about is if you're a Mongo, a Mongo customer today, you're, you're you know, obviously most likely oriented around the document model. And if you're building a streaming system that works with MongoDB, that can be great or it can be problematic depending on which system, where the data is going from what system to what system. And I think, you know, if you're looking at doing stream processing, there's a bunch of options out there. Think about that document model. Think about how flexible it needs to be. Think about if your processor just needs to accept a piece of JSON that I showed earlier, or will it, you know, it might crash. And if it's, a, if it's crashing, then what happens to your business? So think about, think about document model in relation to stream processing. I'll be honest, it's relatively new to, like, we're the, peop we're the people talking about this the most. Obviously, we're MongoDB. So the idea of a document in a stream is natural. We kind of all have been doing that for years. But the idea that your processor has to understand that has sort of been a big friction point and a pain point. So that's, that's one we see a ton. Yeah. Great session. Thank you, Kenny. Um, as you're processing events, can you query MongoDB and add metadata and then output combinations of what you've queried into your events? Yeah, you know, so you kind of pointed out the thing I missed. I was supposed to have a slide on something about this. So let me just talk about it real quick. I'm really glad you brought this up. So two things can happen there. Um, number one is we added dollar lookup. Uh, that was one of the things that we added. So if you're familiar, uh, basically the way this works is it allows you in your pipeline to specify a MongoDB collection, and you're basically going to be doing a lookup against that collection. It's event by event right now. We have some other ideas for how to do it differently, like on a window close or things like this, other schemes. But today it's event by event, and then you join on the key, and then you enrich your document. So if you have, like, let's say you're... Um, you're pulling in, I'm gonna make this up, it might not be perfect, but let's say you're pulling in those sensors that I was talking about, and let's say every sensor ID has some name associated with it or some firmware version that's got more descriptive, more description, you could join on some key and then enrich that document with the description. It's like a super common use case. The other way is, if you're writing like I showed, if you're writing continuously, that continuous merge into, into the collections, you can do whatever you want in Atlas at that point. So if you wanna write um, a, a, a timed trigger off that, or you want to um, use that chain stream downstream for something else, you can do that as well. So kind of two different ways to integrate. One is kind of in, in the stream processor, and the other one is after you've you know, merged to the database. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, hi, uh, great presentation. Uh, quick one. Uh, I can see how deploying a stream processor can be convenient if you're starting from scratch, but if you already have existing applications which are doing your stream processing for you, do you see any advantages to deploying a processor in Atlas versus just in my standalone application that maybe is deployed on the cloud scales, dynamic, uh, whatever the benefits you get from a serverless app would be? Uh, I see what you're saying, yeah. So I, I think that comes, I mean, you're right. There's, there's lots of choices. First of all, totally transparent. There's lots of options out there for stream processing right now, and many of them are very good. I think the thing comes back to is, number one is, how much does the document model matter to you, and how much does the Atlas experience matter to you? 
So if you're a MongoDB first user and you're kind of all in and you're really, you're really deep in the ecosystem, this is adding capability that you used to have to use the connector for, but a whole new level of, of processing capability. So that's kind of number one. And then number two is like, over time, you could just squint with me. I don't want to be too future looking here, but in a, it would make tons of sense in a pipeline to have stages that had cloud functionality. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll let your imagination uh, go, you know, go with what that is. But imagine cloud pieces of functionality inside your pipeline. So leveraging AWS primitives inside that pipeline. That's where we're going. Obviously, that's a longer lead item. We just went GA today. But you're, I think you're thinking a way we are, and a lot of other folks are thinking, is like, how do I leverage some of this stuff? Maybe you've, you've got a bunch of um, um, energy and time put into Lambda functions, for instance. How would that work? Those things are going to be coming. Those, those top-level integrations are going to be something that we really, really focus on. I think that's where your head was at, right? Am I, am I reading you correctly? Yeah, cool. Uh, one question here? Yep. Um, I missed a big part of the presentation, so sorry if it's a repeat. Oh, but, I'll, just, uh, I'll just redo the presentation. Ready? <laughs> no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, just curious about like you know uh, parallel processing capabilities. Like, um, like does it support a similar like uh, what Kafka supports, like partitions and consumer groups? Uh, in uh, in general, like you know, uh, can we see that as a replacement, or can we try and use this? It, uh, does it have all the equivalent capabilities for us to use in place of Kafka? Okay, yeah, great question. So that's a big question. So a bunch of parts to that. So number one, it's not replacing Kafka at this time. So the idea is that we work with Kafka or Red Pant or anything with the Kafka protocol, wire protocol. So we want a maximum interoper interoperability with those systems. That's, that's the first point. So it's not going to replace those things. But you brought up something really good. It's like, do we understand partitions and how to like, run with consumer groups? The answer is yes. We use Liberty Kafka as our driver. And I showed, uh, it may, maybe you saw it or maybe you missed it, but there you can specify the config just like any driver. So you pass in the config for consumer groups, for instance, and, and the driver does its thing like normal. So just a regular proper client, if you will. Um, so yeah, those, those, that's kind of how we, we uh, now parallel processing, one more thing you should know. I didn't show, I, said st I showed you dot start. I didn't say dot start five shards or something like this, or degree of parallelism 10 or something. Today it's one degree of parallelism for a stream processor. We're seeing in the half million message you know, ca uh, processing capability or more right now with that. So it's a lot of workloads work really well with just one, quite frankly. It's very fast. This is actually written using MongoDB. So when you say, when you run a stream processor, it's actually running a very special version of MongoDB. So it's very fast um, and proven. It's a proven piece of code that you're all running your databases on right now. And so we wanted to leverage that as well. But it is not running in parallel just yet, but will be. That's a lot to that question, really good question. Um, so I guess another slight follow-up to that. Is it possible once consume, once the data, let's say a document has been consumed from an input source, is it possible to have multiple different projections or aggregators on that data point without having already saved it to a database and then published to different destination points? Uh, quick answer is yes. So you can have as many stream processors operating on a source stream as you want, a very common use case. You can differentiate them by consumer group, so you have different watermarks of where you'd pick up. Um, and then you can either emit or merge however you want. So if you want to do emit back to Kafka and continue processing down the line, you can do that, or you can just put it in the database, which is what you said you didn't want to do, but that's your other option. Did I answer your question? Um, how does this compare to Kafka Streams, and what are some of the things that Atlas offers over Kafka Streams? Yeah, I mean, look, I said earlier the other question. Um, there's a lot of options out there, and they're all very good. So, you know, we're not going to say that this Kafka Streams is bad or whatever if you have an investment there or you like that or whatever. But th it's different. A couple things that are different. Number one is it's Kafka Streams is written, you'd be writing in Java. Here, you're using mo native MongoDB tools, someone who's not maybe a full time programmer someone who's like a data analyst, it unlocks a whole new capability to a, to a wider variety of users in a really, really easy to use uh, syntax, just like MongoDB. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is complication. Uh, if, you know, some organizations are okay adding more and more things, more and more stacks, more and more vendor relationships, more and more help ticket systems, whatever that might be, and that's fine. Maybe you have a big relationship with Confluent and you're already doing that and that works for you. 
but some folks don't. And some folks say, hey, you know, we've got enough complication, enough sprawl. We're going to try and keep things simple. Atlas Stream Processing can work for this use case. We're not going to need to add more. So I think that's kind of the, the some things. And lastly, kind of the document model. If the document, again, document model matters in your streams and your, in, in, in your scheme is relatively fixed, and you don't need you know, sort of advanced tools for that, that's great. But if you do, obviously, we offer the, a solution there. Good, that's a great question. We have about 30 seconds. Anybody want to squeeze in a last question? All right, I guess, Kenny, you've answered it all. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Give Kenny a round of applause.